All right. Welcome, everyone, to Virtual Vino with DMV Distributing. Devin, in the background here, I have two awesome guests with me this evening on this Friday, the 13th of 2020. So I hope everyone made it through the day. Uh, I did, but only because I knew that I had four amazing wines to drink with you all this evening and chat about. That always brightens my day. Up on screen here, you'll see that we have two amazing guests, like I mentioned earlier, but including Bryce Gillespie from Marquis Selections. So we're gonna be tasting two amazing South African wines from Marquis Selections tonight. The Baxberg Chenin Blanc, the Baxberg Kosher Sparkling Brut, the Cenorio de la Antigua Mentia, and the Lion and Dove Pinot Noir. So listed below is where you can find all four of the wines in Maryland and around the DC area. So thanks as always for being with us this evening. We're gonna take this off here. If you have questions about where these wines are located, you can always ask us and we'll send you that picture as well and the locations. So hi gentlemen, how are you doing this evening? Oh, I believe that you're muted, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. It's Friday the 13th. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Hi, Bryce. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. And you, Devin? It's good to be here. Austin, good to see you again. Good to see you too, Bryce. Yeah. So we've joined, we've let Austin join this evening. He was super excited to chat with you about the South African wines as well. Now, Austin sells around uh, Montgomery County uh, for us here at Dis DMV Distributing. For those of you joining us tonight, if you haven't joined a virtual vino yet, um, pretty much we just drink wines. Um, they change every week uh, for different wines. We have awesome guests like Bryce and my coworker, Austin. If you guys have any comments or questions this evening, let us know. And uh, we also have a line and dove face mask to give away to those of you making comments and asking questions. Hello, Angela, how are you? Those of you watching, let us know where you're watching from. Say hi. There's an example of one of our line and dove face masks. So ask us questions, leave comments. Bryce as always has really, really great stories about the Baxford uh, vineyard and winery in South Africa that he'll be sharing a little bit later. So Bryce, um, if you can kick us off this evening, now, guys, if you have the Baxberg Chenin Blanc, go ahead and pour yourselves a glass before we get to tasting it. Yes. It's absolutely delicious. You won't regret it. And Bryce, if you can share with us a little bit about yourself and Marquis Selections so everyone gets to know you. Sure. So like you mentioned, my name is Bryce. Uh, I work with Marquis Selections. That's a small little wine importer based in the Midwest. And we bring in Baxberg estate setters out of South Africa. Uh, I'm originally from South Africa. I moved here last year in April to marry my wife in Portland, Oregon. And I used to work at Baxburg for pretty much three years before I came over here. So got a couple of stories, drank a few of the wines once or twice. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a real, real pleasure to be back here again. I think Devin, you and I, we've, we're old hands at this now. I've done it with you guys four, five, six times. Um, we are pros at this point, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, we always appreciate it. We love the support that we get from you guys in Maryland and DC. And it's a real pleasure to go through the Shannon and the Kosher Brood with you. Well, thank you. And um, it was an excellent choice this evening. As those of you might know, I absolutely love a really crisp, dry white wine. And that includes this evening's Shannon Blanc. So I did make a post earlier about the fact that I hope I had any left by the time we started the video. but. I promise I just opened it a few minutes ago. So I behaved on this lovely Friday evening. <laughs> Very surprising. I know, I know. So Bryce, if you can tell us a little bit about Baxberg Winery to kick us off. I know in between our wines as well, we're gonna share a video from Simon Back himself. Um, but to kick off talking about the Baxberg Chenin Blanc, a little bit about the grape and the winery itself. Yeah, for sure. So Baxberg is one of the older uh, family-owned estates in South Africa. It was established in 1916 by Charles Louis Back. He was the first generation. Um, and over the years, his son took over and then his son after him. And now it's currently owned by a fourth generation, Simon Back, who we will see a little video from in a few minutes. Um, and coincidentally, Simon has also just had a young baby last year, January. So the, the hope is that the fifth generation will take over in a few years time, a few, let's say 18 years, I think in South Africa. Um, so yeah, legacy is going strong. 
And originally it started uh, a couple of mixed bag farming activities, but the general trend moved over to wine. The focus became wine. And in the 1970s, Baxburg became the first winery in South Africa to actually open its doors to receive people for tastings. And at the time it was seen as a crazy, crazy move. People couldn't understand what they were doing and saying you were gonna lose your retail customers if you're selling directly to the public. But I mean, as we know, it was the right decision and it's just proved to be a really, really good stepping stone in setting Baxburg up as one of the kind of premier destinations for uh, wine lovers in South Africa. People join us for restaurant visits, for wine tastings. We've got a lovely little park that we have some music concerts in the summer. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful estate. Now to chat about the, the Chenin Blanc a little bit, if you're not familiar with the variety, uh, it is the most widely planted white variety in South Africa. Um, it's not a blend, it's a single varietal, so like Sauvignon Blanc or Chenin Ach or uh, Chardonnay or Pinot Gris, it's its own variety. And it's generally known for being just a really light, fresh, fruity and approachable wine. You can get a lot of different styles over in it though. It's a very, very versatile grape. Um, the you can get it anywhere from like a, a really kind of dry, dry, dry minerally type of style through to a fresh and fruity one, which is what Baxburg is, through to a more heavy and rich style, which is put into wooden barrels. You can do it as a sweet dessert wine in a late harvest. You can do it as a sparkling wine. But where South Africa really loves Chenin Blanc is in their brandy production. South Africans love their brandy. Um, they mix it with Coke. It's a very, very staple drink amongst the um, South African public, I guess. <laughs> And a lot of Chenin Blanc is used for brandy production. But on the Baxburg, a uh, little quick sort of technical rundown. The wine, the cellar comes in, it's fermented in stainless steel tanks. Um, it's then cold stabilized for a few days and then we bottle it pretty early, pretty fresh. So you get a really nice approachable wine that's made to be drunk young, but it's one that actually does pretty well with a few years of age. So I mean, if you find one on the shelf that's kind of got two, three vintages back, it can be really, really delicious. It tends to get a little bit of secondary fruit characters that come out, a little bit softer, a little bit rounder. Beautiful wine that tends to do well with food. Devin, as you know, when it's younger like this, nice and fresh, it does really well by itself. Pair it with more of it and you've got a winning combination. <laughs> that in my belly exactly, Bryce. Now, I know that the Chenin Blanc as well, um, especially for over 1300 years has been a widely grown and heavily cultivated grape in the Loire Valley of France. So how did it end up in South Africa? So South Africans pretty much like most other wine regions, uh, new world wine regions bought in clippings from um, Europe to plant in their kind of domestic markets. So after like a bunch of different trial and error between Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay and Pinot Grigio and I mean, whatever have you with white varieties, they started to see that Chenin Blanc did really, really well in the South African climate. Now, most people are not aware that the South African wine region as a whole has a lot of individual um, wine growing regions and districts and wards and mesoclimates and microclimates you can get really, really interesting. This map is a really good example of what you're looking at. And depending on where it's grown, what kind of weather you have, what kind of soil you have, what your rainfall is, what your sun exposure is, you can get a lot of different characteristics that come from the fruit. And Chenin Blanc, as I mentioned earlier, it's definitely not a one trick pony. You can get a lot of different characters coming from it depending on how it's grown and how it's made in the cellar. So once that versatility was discovered, then it just completely took off. And I believe it's uh, Lauren Bezeo. She is the, um, she covers a lot of South Africa for Wine Enthusiast magazine. She wrote last year in an article saying that South Africa now produces better Chenin Blanc than the Loire in France. So I know the Frenchies are not happy about that. I was going to say, hate me Uncle Laura, I bet. <laughs> Good for her. <laughs> well, yeah, you so would definitely most, have to most, do a side-by-side, -side, and that would not be a bad thing, everyone, because they're equally delicious in both places. That way I don't get hate mail, per se. <laughs> but I will admit that the Chenin Blanc is absolutely delicious. It's super refreshing. Now, if you guys have this with you this evening, if you're tasting along with us, you'll notice as a really nice... Uh, very see-through pale lemon color and the it's got a great aroma like Bryce was saying earlier this is a very fruity forward white wine which is why I love it especially but you get a lot of peach melon and a little bit of pineapple off of this wine to me as well so like Bryce also mentioned it pairs really great with food but 
I wouldn't even pair it with any food. I would just pair it with maybe a second bottle by accident. <laughs> <laughs> but especially a friend's night, you know, even if you're enjoying your quarantine with some Netflix, this is one of those wines that you can easily grab out of your refrigerator and enjoy all evening long with or without food. Um, food pairings, Bryce, I think you'll agree as well. It pairs really great with salads. If you're a poultry fan, if you love chicken, um, vegetables, or even light fish, um, this wine would pair excellently with. Absolutely. Yeah. Those kind of light uh, seafood dishes, some shellfish, some chilled shellfish. Um, does, oh, did I leave out the H there? Chilled shellfish. That's tough to say. It does really well with those. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, Bryce. Um, now, Austin, I know that, you know, we've uh, recently been selling quite a lot of Baxberg wines because obviously they're absolutely amazing. Now, one thing to let everyone know that who's joining us this evening. Now, this is a family owned almost going to be fifth generation winery, like Bryce mentioned. And the average price in store for the Chenin Blanc is only $13.99 in Maryland and around DC, which is absolutely excellent. If you pick up a Chenin Blanc from France that is this quality, you're gonna pay double that. Easy, absolutely. And with the tariffs on the French wines coming out now, Chenin Blanc is not gonna be pitching more than 14% alcohol 95% of the time. So Southern Hemisphere is where to look. Exactly. It's yeah. Now, mm -hmm. I was saying it was easy. It's easy drinking and refreshing. I mean, the, the price on that, it's perfect. I've never really drank much before, and this is by far one of my favorite wines now, to be honest. Exactly. So yeah. Now, I see Tatiana is pairing it with her salmon Caesar salad. Definitely. So, two things I mentioned salads. A fish, salmon, especially any of those dry white wines that have that those fruity aromas, even the light fruit taste to them are absolutely amazing to pair with those. Um, now, one thing to note about uh, the Baxberg Winery and Bryce, we've talked about this recently, is that it's sustainably farmed. Can you explain a little bit about how they're farmed that way and what yeah. it is? Absolutely. So sustainability, I mean, around the world is at the moment, it's an absolute absolute key point um and it's really easy for us to talk about it now in kind of present times what's really cool to talk about in terms of backsburg is the back family has been focusing on this concept of being um responsible environmental stewards for future generations has been in play for a really long time michael back third generation owner of backsburg started this path in the really early 2000s probably late 90s and in 2006, Baxberg was certified the first carbon neutral winery in South Africa. And at the time was the third winery in the world to be so. So that picture you're looking at there is Michael back in the background and Simon back in the foreground. Simon is Michael's son. Simon is now the fourth generation owner and Michael back there with the pink frame glasses and what you can't see are his polka dot socks that he always wears with the shorts. He's the kind of maverick in the sustainability industry within South Africa, or the sustainability sector, sorry. There are a lot of fantastic initiatives on the farm that uh, go hand in hand to complement and contribute to our carbon neutral, um, our carbon offsets. So the concept of carbon neutral, what that means is we just offset 100% of our carbon emissions. So everything we're doing from driving our cars, making wine in the cellar, working in the vineyards, uh, procuring supplies from our suppliers and our vendors and sending the wine over to our local domestic market as well as our international markets. All of that is taken into account into our annual audit and it's quantified into uh, a number that represents our carbon emissions. And we make sure that all our initiatives done on the farm add up to negate all of those. So we're actually carbon negative, but that's not uh, something that you can technically say, so we're carbon neutral. And that's achieved by real like cool things done in the cellar, like um, skylights throughout the building rather than relying on electricity, LED lighting, uh, very, very tight water control measures. Uh, our tanks in the cellar during fermentation are not chilled using electricity, rather they are chilled through a process that's done with a biomass boiler uh, which does a heat exchange process whereby we burn excess wood chips from local sawmills and then convert that into energy to chill the water that surrounds the jackets of our stainless steel tanks during fermentation. 
Um, we have a really cool system of planting vines in a number of our vineyards called the layer system, which allows us to put more vines into each hectare and then also oh, each acre and then not have to drive our tractors as much through the vineyard. So we're getting less soil compaction, it's less soil management. Um, we are using less gas in the tractors. We're using smaller trucks and vehicles on the farm. And the biggest influence, the biggest impact that we do is our tree planting program. And we're talking about thousands of trees planted every single year, both on the farm as well in the local surrounding areas. So all of that adds up to, as I mentioned earlier, reducing our carbon emissions and contributing to being a carbon neutral winery. Now, Bryce, also last time when you were on, we talked about how the winery also uses lightweight bottles. So Austin, when you poured your Chenin Blanc, did you notice the lightweight bottle? Yeah, no, it's actually very light. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'd never noticed, so I was holding. Keep on drinking more and more. <laughs> well, I mean, and they also do get more lightweight because it's very delicious, so you drink it quite quickly. So that that's also it. makes it more lightweight, guys. That's, that's a reality, yeah. <laughs> but for so, shipping purposes, a, you know, it makes a, a huge difference, even exactly. in your cost and shipping in general, gas, everything like that. So guys, I would absolutely recommend uh, going to their website. We have the link right here as well for you all, but it lists all of their conservation efforts, which is so great. And it, you know, you really appreciate it. We had a comment earlier, I think Gina just mentioned, so I can feel good about the environment and drink my wine. Absolutely. Say what? 100% you can. Right. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> I got a question about the bottle itself. Um, I used to work in the beer industry and they have like different kind of colors just for lighting and stuff. But like, is there a reason why this bottle is green compared to a lot of other? Yeah. So the biggest reason why you're going to have color in a glass rather than having a, a clear bottle is UV protection. So wine is a pretty sensitive uh, beverage. It's a sensitive um, liquid. So if you get a lot of UV exposure, you can spoil the wine. So, I mean, when you talk about how wine is stored, like in your house, you're going to keep it away from windows where there's direct sunlight coming in. You're not going to keep it on top of your fridge in your kitchen, which has a lot of heat fluctuation. You're not going to keep it in a super dry area. So all of those factors contribute into keeping your wine stable and not spoiling. So again, we spoke about how this wine is meant to be drunk young and fresh. So storage is not really too much of a factor, but Baxburg, we're not making bad wine we're making really great wine so if people are keeping it away and they are storing it for a little bit we don't want it to get damaged if it is exposed to light hence the color the green color to stop the uv right on all right so we are going to show a video from simon back for those of you that are joining us this evening thanks so much we hope you're enjoying and learning a lot from bryce as always if you have questions, write us on our comment section here and we'll get to those after the video. Now, Simon Back uh, sent this in to us to say hello to you all. So we're gonna share that now. I'm Simon Back from Backsburg. Uh, hello to the folks of Maryland DC and of course DMV Distributing. Um, sorry that I couldn't be with you in person one o'clock in the morning here, or at least when you do this call. And um, yeah, but just thanks for all the support and keep selling Backsburg. As you can see today, it's a, a beautiful warm day here. Uh, we're almost fully in summer now and uh, we're looking forward to, to the, the grapes ripening and a, and a fantastic harvest in 2021. So take care. Oh, that was so nice of him. And I, I'll be honest, I did like him until he said that it's summer there now. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm getting moving. a lot of pictures from, Does he need help there now? <laughs> pictures from family and friends back in South Africa at the moment. And it's breaking my heart here in Portland. It's just getting miserable. And those cars are going into a fantastic time of year. Yeah. Um, ours is just switching every single day here in Maryland still. So oh, yeah. you never know what you're going to wake up to. No one day and hot weather the next. <laughs> oh, no. All right, guys. Now we have a couple Washington Post articles we want to share with you about uh, two Baxburg wines. One of them we're going to pop open next. That's right. It's the sparkling wine. So we're just going to pop it open because it's Friday. Um, we're also going to share the Washington Post review for their uh, Chardonnay as well. So we'll pop those up on screen for you. Here's the sparkling brute from the Washington Post. It was rated excellent. Like I said, we are going to pop this uh, we're open next, so we'll share a little bit more about that wine. But Dave McIntyre, thank you so much for the great write-up there. And the Baxburg Chardonnay, so that also received an excellent rating. 
Um, so right there you see clean, refreshing and racy with citrus blossom, jasmine and lemongrass notes. This wine shows true Chardonnay flavor, un unencumbered by oak. So for those of you that um, also go kosher as well, it, both of these next uh, products are kosher and these Washington uh, Post write-ups, um, but they're also unoaked. So your, well, excuse me, your Chardonnay is unoaked. So if you are one of those anything but oak Chardonnay fans, like myself usually, um, that one's for you. So find your closest store that has it. But as always, if your local liquor store, your favorite liquor store that you run into doesn't have any of the products that we show here on DMV, just tell them to contact us and we'll make sure that they carry it for you. All right. So without further ado, I say let's get into the bubblies, fella. All right. So Bryce, if you want to go um, over uh, how the method works for them making this kosher brute, um, I've tasted it before quite a few times. This is one of my favorite to sell at the moment in terms of any uh, dry brutes that we sell here because it is one of those that is, um, it's hand-picked grapes and it is super fruity, but also very dry. So this is one of the brutes that also for all of your family um, parties coming up, socially distance wise, any of your close knit gatherings you have, this is definitely one to pair with your, your Thanksgiving meals. No, absolutely. So what I'll tell about quickly before we talk about the wine is uh, you mentioned that they're kosher, or at least this brute is kosher and the Chardonnay that was written up by the Washington Post is kosher. Yes. Vaxberg produces four kosher wines that we sell in the US. And the kind of history behind that is, I mentioned the farm was established in 1916 by Charles Louis Back. He was actually a Lithuanian Jewish refugee who arrived in South Africa in 1902. Now, I heard a story that apparently when he was uh, fleeing Lithuania, the plan was actually to get on a ship that was going to the US or Canada, uh, got on the wrong boat and landed up in South Africa. So, I mean, he was off to a running start straight away. Um, and he ended up working in the port of Cape Town and then got a job at a butcher shop. And as legend has it, someone walked into the shop one day and said, hey, do you want to buy a farm? And he said, yeah, I'll buy a farm. And there we have it, 1916, the start of Baxburg. So the kosher range of wines that Baxburg produces is an homage to that uh, Jewish history from Lithuania. And I believe, I could be wrong here, but I think 2020 was the 20th vintage of doing kosher wines from Baxburg. So I've been doing it for a long time. They've got it pretty much down to a T. Uh, for those people who don't know how the kind of kosher production works, when the, the fruit is picked and it comes through and it's crushed and the juice is exposed to the air, no one can touch it but uh, a practicing Jew or an Orthodox Jew or a rabbi. So we have a very special person who comes into the cellar to handle the making of the wine. Uh, his title is the Maschiach, the caretaker. Um, and he's been with Baxburg for, I think, pretty much every vintage we've done. So he likes to say that he's the winemaker, which really irritates our winemaker, Alicia. <laughs> she's standing in the back watching over, making sure everything's done. So she's actually the winemaker. She makes sure everything gets done properly. Um, and our wines are not only kosher and kosher for Passover, they're also mevushel. So that means anyone is able to pour and handle the wines. And where that kind of comes in is once the, for in the case of white wines, uh, before fermentation, so just after the juice is pressed off the skins, they'll go through a process called flash pasteurization, where they are heated up really, really quickly to 86 degrees Celsius and then brought down almost instantly. I mean, we're talking about five seconds, I think, total from that kind of uh, increase and decrease in temperature, which then makes the wine mevo shell and allows you want to handle it. In the case of the red wines, it's after fermentation, but the process is the same. Um, with the kosher brut that we're talking about here, the brut MCC, MCC stands for Method of Seek, which is the, you okay there, Austin? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It wants you to drink it. <laughs> it's telling you, it's sending you a message. That's it. Um, the, yeah, when you open a bottle of champagne, safety tip, don't try this at home. Always keep the cage on when you take that cork out. If you take that cage off without holding your thumb on your top, you could be in for a big surprise. Surprise. Or I you mean, can what, do it on purpose to wake your friends up. What's the ridiculous statistic out there? It's something like more people die from flying champagne corks than shark attacks every year. <laughs> you know, that doesn't surprise me. If you scroll through Instagram, anything that has to do with sparkling wine, you will see some really great videos, including yeah. a lot with horses that I, I still I'll never understand. 
Um, okay, so you're saying what uh, the MCC stands for? Yeah, so MCC, Method Cup Classique, that is the designation for uh, the traditional Champenois method of um, sparkling wine production that's used in South Africa. So if you know this, uh, Champagne can only be called Champagne if it's from the Champagne region in France. So other countries have different designations, like uh, uh, Spain has Cava, uh, mm -hmm. South Africa has MCC, Method Cup Classique. And in order to be a method cup to seek, there are a few regulations that you have to adhere to. One of them being the wine has to be in bottle uh, for the secondary fermentation for at least 12 months before you disgorge it. So I realize I probably said some stuff that some people don't know. Secondary fermentation, what you'll do is you'll make a, a base wine, general fermentation on a still wine, and then you'll put it into these beautiful, bigger sparkling wine bottles. And you'll add a secondary little bit of yeast and you'll seal it up with a, a beer cap, or just a crown top. And then it'll sit on those leaves for a year. Like I said, with its MCC, it's going to be 12 months. And it ferments again inside the bottle, which creates the bubbles. Then disgorging is where you kind of, over time, you'll slowly tilt, 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 tilt the bottle so that all that yeast kind of runs down into the neck. And then they'll freeze it and then they'll disgorge, which means they pop that beer top off and it kind of spits out the yeast and the gunk. And then they do what's called a dosage, a little top up of extra juice. Sometimes it's a little bit sweeter just to add a little bit of sugar to bring it up from the dry level. And then they'll put the cork, the cage and the capsule on and there you have it and you're good to go. And that's exactly what happens on this one. It's a 50-50 blend of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. So the still base wines are made separately mm -hmm. and then blended and then into bottle for secondary fermentation for 12 months. And then it's disgorged. We actually do not do a dosage on here. We don't add, oh, sorry, we add base wine, but we don't add any sugar to it. So the little slight hint of sweetness that you get on here is naturally from the fruit because the kosher yeasts that we use in producing this wine do not ferment the wine 100% dry. So it goes all the way down. So I think it's about five or six grams per liter residual sugar. And that's just kind of a natural product of the wine making method that we use. And then you get this really, really beautiful, light, fresh, approachable wine. I think that Washington Post description that Dave McIntyre put on pretty much sums up exactly how this wine performs. And it really, really is a fantastic, easy drinking, approachable wine. And Devin, like you and I discussed before this, we are having it uh, second in the lineup because we want to chat about how champagne uh, sparkling wine shouldn't be just relegated to celebrations and only at the beginning. You can have bubbles whenever you want. Bubbles is an anytime affair. It's like breakfast food works for you any time of the day. Hence, mimosas and end of the night. That's what the rest of mine is going to be tomorrow. And if my cat doesn't drink it all right now. <laughs> now, I used to uh, work at a local winery, for those of you that don't know. And I was a part of that process uh, quite often. I was actually in charge of, like you mentioned earlier, um, adding more sugar into it afterwards because I was very accurate and good with the pipette. However, um, the disgorging of it is super fun. Um, never do it with your friends, though, because they will aim quite a lot of the bottles at you if you are friends with your coworkers. Um, and you'll end up a hot mess by the end of the day. But, you know, for those of you that live around Maryland or the D.C. area, you can always ask your local wineries if they need help in that process because it is, it is a very time consuming process. And a lot of them do look for volunteers as well. So I'm sure Baxburg, you know, being a larger winery, especially in exporting quite a bit now, you know, they have enough staff. But don't be afraid to ask your local wineries because it is a really great, uh, very educational process to even be a part of. And it's super fun. Um, just make sure that you bring extra clothes with you for the drive home because if you get pulled over, you'll be in trouble for <laughs> not smelling so great, guys, for, for driving. <laughs> um, now, like Bryce mentioned, um, and we have mentioned, if you enjoy bubbles, if you enjoy anything that has that really nice and fruity crispness to it, if you enjoy a fr nice fruity wine, this is absolutely for you guys. Um, now, I want to show a picture from the vineyard, Bryce, before we let you go, because the last time we were on here as well, we shared the entrance pictures um, as well. So we're going to show a few of these now, guys. Um, the vineyard itself is absolutely amazing. There's the entrance there. So, Bryce, if you can share with everyone the story behind the, the four barrels up on top entrance there. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, the you see the entrance here. It's a pretty iconic sort of gateway into Baxburg. When you drive along this road, uh, you see the Simonsburg mountain in the back there. And that mountain serves as the dividing line between the Stellenbosch district of South Africa and the Paul district. So Baxburg is on the Paul side of it. 
And it's a really, really beautiful backdrop that the winery is situated on. The vineyards kind of run up the slope on the side of that mountain. And the four barrels that you see on the archway are representations of the four generations of back family ownership. Now, I mentioned earlier that Simon recently had a young son by the name of Eli. And when uh, he and his partner Caroline were in the hospital and they, the baby was born, Simon's dad drove down straight away and put that little uh, sherry uh, barrel in between as a signifying factor of the new addition to the back family. So when Simon and Caroline arrived home, they arrived home to this and everyone thought it was a really, really cool story and a really cute way for Michael to show his affection. I absolutely love that story, Bryce. I perhaps I've been watching too much of The Crown recently to uh, catch up for the new season, but it always reminds me of you know ringing the bell when they had royalty, newborns, etc. And it's just here's our barrel edition there. So it's absolutely it's actually great. It's really funny that you you re, you're kind of comparing it to The Crown because when you talk to Michael back and I mentioned about how much of a maverick he is in sustainability and trying like things that people have never thought of and would never say would work, he refers to Baxburg as the principality of Baxburg. He does what he wants in there. It's his own little country within South Africa. <laughs> so See, I'm that, on to something this yeah, Friday evening. <laughs> well, you can let him know I said that. I completely uh, compared him to Queen Elizabeth of, of England. So <laughs> you're, you're welcome, Simon, back. <laughs> I'll let him know. <laughs> I still like you, even though it's summer there. <laughs> so for those of you joining us, we're going to show some more pictures of the gorgeous winery there in South Africa. Um, absolutely a place and a vineyard to put, put on your bucket list whenever we can travel again. Um, it's absolutely gorgeous. The wines are to die for. The average price in store for this kosher brut that we showcase this evening is only $24.99 in stores around Maryland and D.C., for something this high quality, this fifth generation owned wine, it should be double that, guys. So definitely go out and pick up a bottle, maybe two bottles, probably at least three bottles for your Thanksgiving dinners. It's going to pair well with everything you're having for Thanksgiving. You can drink it for after during. It's going to pair great with anything. Yeah. And there's some of the trees that we there. mentioned being planted. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And then that's some of the, what we do is we plant uh, eucalyptus trees. Mm -hmm. uh, which is another thing that, well, I, I won't get dragged into that story now, but it's another exciting thing that we do in terms of the sustainability side of things. But we use, they, they grow really quickly. So we're able to use them as um, poles for our, our vineyard poles, as well as then, of course, like I mentioned in the biomass boiler, the excess wood chips that we use in that heat exchange process. This is an example of the liar system of trellising where the, the vines are bought outside. Uh, sorry, they're, they're bought uh, bent over rather than vertically positioned, which is your kind of standard way of, of positioning or trellising the vines. And this just allows for more vines per acre, more coverage, um, and then less distance traveled by the machinery. Great. Now, does that affect the irrigation through those, through the bottom of the vines as well, where you're kind of having a two in one? Yeah, it does They're affect fighting over the water. <laughs> so yeah, for sure. They, they, the, the more vines that you have, you've got a lot of competition, which is of course what you want and want. You don't want them growing super easily. You want them to fight. You want them to really have to work to produce the fruit. Yes. The irrigation system that we have there is pretty similar to what a lot of guys uh, do in wine production. It's just a simple drip irrigation method where you've got a pipe running through that'll just slowly drop drips of water just to make sure that the vines don't die. As you know, South Africa can be quite arid. Um, it just come out of a, a long series of droughts. So it's important to have that ability to irrigate. Oh, that's awesome, Bryce. Now, if you guys have any questions before we let Bryce go this evening, uh, let us know. Hey, Greg, how are you? We're going to check out the comments here. Oh, I know. Isn't the tiny barrel story amazing? And yes, Steve, I did take your uh, fashion advice this evening. Here's your pink tie. You have a question. Is it always vintage? Okay, yeah. So I see Susan, question. Susan's question there. So it is now, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, 2016 was the first vintage year for the Brute. Then you guys are tasting 2017 and 2018 will be arriving soon. And it was in essence a vintage wine before 2016, but we always, we had it as a non-vintage in case we did need to blend uh, something back from a previous year. And this is definitely one. Oh. I'm not even going to make a mimosa with it this morning. It's actually just going to be breakfast. <laughs> no, OJ, just spoil this. <laughs> right? 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's a great Friday evening wine. So if you guys don't yet have it, like we mentioned, go out and support Baxburg Winery. Go like their Facebook page, visit their websites. Definitely add them to your bucket list. Bryce, once yeah. again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It was always a pleasure. Thank you, Devin. Uh, Baxburg actually just launched a brand new website, I think uh, a week or so ago. So definitely check it out. It's beautiful. It's, I was on it this week. It looks amazing. Their yeah. pictures are fantastic. Um, Angela, I was kidding. Bring some OJ <laughs> for yourself. <laughs> but no, the, the website's super great. I love the pictures. All of the wines displayed on there. Definitely a place I plan to visit in near future once we can travel again. And um, Simon Back, if you watch this video later, thank you so much for your video. Thanks entirely for producing amazing wines there. And um Good luck with the family. Maybe you'll have another little tiny barrel to add up there eventually. We'll never know. <laughs> Pretty we'll long. Make the thing longer eventually. It'll just be quite wider. The entrance is going to be about a half mile wide, you know, 100 years from now. <laughs> that's it. That's it. <laughs> cool. Well, Devin, Austin, thank you so much. Great to see you guys. Always a pleasure. And thank you again for supporting the wines. We really appreciate it. As always, Bryce. Take care, and we will see you next time. All right. Have a good weekend. Yeah, you <laughs> too. All right, I'm going to drink more of this bubbly for Bryce since he didn't have any this evening. Say he's always a joy. <laughs> he's always a joy to listen to. Him, I swear. Definitely, he's so knowledgeable, Bryce. We absolutely love having you. Now, for those of you joining this evening, we are going to end the show with two red wines that we carry through DMV. You can find them around Maryland and DC. We're going to start off with the scenario this evening, but before we get to that. We have a few Washington Post uh, articles also to share with you. So guys, if you see any of these wines in your local stores, or if they look amazing and you want to try them, like I said, just screenshot a picture of this video, go to our Facebook page at DMV Dist. We always post our Washington Post reviews, but go out and find yourselves these bottles. They're so fantastic. We have the Castantis Lima Quid Pro Quo that was rated good to excellent. Thanks, Dave McIntyre, for the write-up in Washington Post. Now, that's a newly released wine from uh, here in Maryland in the D.C. area. I'm sorry, the font's too little to read, guys. <laughs> but a great wine there. Uh, next up, we have... Ah... Uh, Spanish Alberino for you. I love the label of the Pazo de Villare. Um, absolutely gorgeous. Got a thumbs up from Austin over here. Uh, this is one we should feature for you guys. Now, average uh, price on there is $17 worth every penny if you guys have not tried this. The Alberino is uh, best known in Spain as well as northern Portugal. Um, absolutely delicious wine. If you like a white wine, if you enjoyed the Chenin Blanc, if you had it earlier, this just has a little bit more of a ripe apricot taste, but it still has that peachiness to it as well. So one of my favorites that we carry here in DM, uh, DMV, but rated excellent to extraordinary. I also like to say it has like a little bit more of the intensity of acidity, so it makes it more your mouth more watery. Yeah, it does. It does. It's delicious. Very delicious. And one of the coolest bottles you'll ever see on the shelf, especially in the white wine section. Absolutely. Ah, our Chateau Croix du Amand Cuvée Reserve uh, from Corbiers. So that was also rated excellent to extraordinary. Now this is a 97 point rated wine that you can get for less than $20 at your local stores around Maryland or DC. We featured this a few weeks ago. Guys, if you have not tried this wine yet, I cannot say enough great things about this wine. It's absolutely delicious. It's gonna age and taste even better. But go ahead, if you find it at a store, just grab up a whole case for your family because you will be fighting over this wine. You okay. can pair it with anything, drink it without food. <laughs> I'll spin you agree. <laughs> they get 97 points for nothing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's not 97 points for nothing. It absolutely earned it. So go out, grab yourself a bottle of the Quad du Amant. It has the absolutely gorgeous label there that's very uh, rustic, a little bit antique looking. Oh, and our I am boxed wine. So <clears throat> I hate to say it, but with other lockdowns perhaps looming, uh, you know, it's boxed wine time once again. So our I am Pinot Grigio is featured as well in the Washington Post. This refreshing, 
Let's see here. Ah, here's proof box wine can be downright delicious for the equivalent of $5 a bottle. Absolutely right. So if you see any of the IM, you'll see it right there in the middle of the screen, any of your stores that carry that. All of their varietals are delicious. Um, the Pinot Grigio, exceptional though. So go out, grab yourself some of the IM bibs. And that way, if you want wine that'll last you all week long, or if you're just with four kids that are distance learning on their computers, it'll last you at least a day and a half. I would say go as quick as possible because they are selling off the shelf. <laughs> they are. They're flying already this week. That and toilet paper, guys. I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Holly, that was a Chenin Blanc in the green bottle. All right. So we are going to get to the uh, scenario here. Now, Austin, if you want to tell everyone a little bit about the scenario. Now, this is a wine that I... Um, I love to share with everyone because I do, I absolutely love the label. We were talking about the night on the front of it earlier, a really great Spanish wine, but this is a wine where if you usually like those fruity, uh, very easy to drink reds, but you've perhaps never heard of the Minthea grape, this one's for you. It is, no, I mean, it's, I've been doing a little bit of some research on it. It's actually pretty interesting just because actually kind of somewhat in a rare grape in a way, just because it's only made in Spain and Portugal. That's it. Um, uh, and I mean, we, like you said, we were talking about the label itself earlier and uh, it's, it's Senorio de la Antica, Antiqua. And uh, Antiqua is like an antique. And uh, what they're really like passionate about is they're pretty much, they show a lot about their cathedrals and stuff over there and their castles and stuff. So, I didn't really find too much about what the night really represents in a way, but that kind of shows what, I mean, they're, they're all about their cathedral and castles. That kind of like, you know, shows in that way with the, with the night itself. I think it was kind of pretty cool um, uh, with their label. It kind of makes it more authentic from uh, what they're all about over there. Um, uh, and the vineyard itself is actually, uh, the history is more than 500 years old over there, which is really cool. Um, uh, and uh, with the grapes itself, um, uh, each and every, I mean, they always grow, you know, each, each and every year. Um, uh, but the vines that they use are 30 to 60 year old today that are, that are grown in 400 to 800 meters above the sea level, um, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, but like, I'm not sure. I mean, I've said this before about old vines itself, um, uh, 30 to 60 year old or plus more. Old vines actually gives you a little bit more concentrated grapes, but you get less yield. Um, uh, so they take pride into that. And uh, what's really cool is that today itself, they manually pick the grapes, which uh, kind of just do, like it's kind of like more of like a family oriented kind of uh, uh, vineyard itself. And um, they take, like I said, they take really a lot of pride in that. And so they maximize the quality of it just because they only get a, they only get a certain amount of grapes from uh, older vines. Um, mm -hmm. For, you know, what you get out of this is actually amazing because it's not that expensive, to be honest for getting uh, less grapes. Exactly, and Austin, one thing to point out to everyone uh, joining us this evening, this is a 92 point rated wine from wine enthusiasts that we're showcasing this evening from, like you mentioned, older vines. So exceptional grapes. Uh, when the vines have less grapes on it, that means that the quality of those grapes have fought for all the water that they could get. When the grapes fight, like we mentioned with Bryce and how their irrigation system works and their split vines there. Um, these grapes are very high quality. So I don't. Well, I and mean, the one thing I've well. <laughs> say was in the area, they always tell people in Spain, or if you go to go visit Spain, to visit this certain area, region, which is called Leon, because mm -hmm. it's actually in the middle of like mountains. It's kind of very hard to get to. Yes. Um, uh, and the mountains actually drain the water down to the vines to help it give it more, you know, life itself which is pretty cool. I read about that, yeah. Definitely. Now, if you guys are drinking this long with us, um, if you wanna take a look at the color of this wine, I always love the color of it. It's got a red ruby color, but it also has a red brick colored rim. So the rim of it is a little bit brighter than the rest of the wine. So it gets a little bit more intense as you look down through the wine there. Uh, has a very medium deep 
uh, body to it, but it also has a black fruit aroma. So for those of you that really like those dark blackberries, even your raspberries as well pop out in this. Black plums hurt. especially, the black currant. Uh, but this wine is really well balanced and it's super great for food pairing. So if you're looking for wines to pair with your Thanksgiving meals coming up, if you're looking for wines for this weekend, if you barbecue, the Minthea grape is really great to pair with ribs. So if you, if you have some really nice juicy ribs, throw on the grill this weekend while we still have a little bit of uh, hot weather here. <sighs> still jealous of Simon back down there in, uh, in Summerland there. Um, but this wine really pairs well with your barbecue. So I highly recommend barbecue this weekend. If you got a bottle from your local store and drank along with us this evening, drink the rest of it during a barbecue. Either a, pastrami, a pastrami sandwich. You know, I mean, a lot of people like pastrami. <laughs> it pairs very well with that. You know? yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, yes, Monica. Um, Austin's dog is is joining and at least I have no one up on my table anymore trying to knock over wine. That was a close call earlier. I'm glad I have quick reflexes over here because the sparkling wine about took a nosedive on the carpet. Um, so like we mentioned, if you've never tried the Minthea grape, I highly recommend it. Austin told you a little bit about it as well. Um, now we mentioned some food pairings, but the fact that this wine at a 92 point rated wine is only on average 12.99 in store is amazing. So if you haven't tried it yet, I can't recommend it enough. Easy wine to find. It's the one with the night on it. Boop. And for being 20, like I've said earlier, for $12.99 and for old vine grapes, mm -hmm. it's steel. Absolutely steel. Mm -hmm. And it's easy drinking. Doesn't have too much tannins too. I would say softer tannins. Definitely. Now similar to our next wine we're going to get into. So for those of you that are joining, if you have questions about this scenario, let us know. If you don't, we're going to move on to our Line and Dove Pinot Noir. Now, I mentioned both of these wines are quite similar, obviously completely different uh, grape varietals, but the taste to these grapes is very similar. And the I think Pinot Noir, however, being a little bit harder to grow, quite a bit harder to grow than the Minthea. <laughs> well, I was... I was I think it's just they actually some people actually make a mistake with uh, the grapes itself just because they're so somewhat similar. What I read about actually, yeah. I, if yeah. you're going to do a blind tasting, I think depending on how the winemaker uh, either oaks the grapes, doesn't you know whatever decisions they make to make their wines, it can definitely be mistaken for one of the other. I mean, think for so long, uh, everyone mistake mistook a Merlot in Chile for, oh wait, it's actually the Carmenere that they thought was lost forever. So it happens. There are a lot of grapes. <laughs> All Absolutely. right, so on to the, the line and Dove Pinot Noir. Yeah, so I mean, the line and Dove Pinot Noir, I mean, it's pretty much our brand itself. Um, uh, it is kosher, vegan, and gluten-free. Um, um, and I actually love the label itself. It's very clean, but elegant. I've been saying these days where like the line is kind of represents more of like the strength and like the dove itself represents love, kind of like we, what we all need today. So go grab your line of dove wines, to be honest. Um, uh, but the label itself, I've been telling a lot of my accounts is that it's made from a tattoo artist in Frederick, which is really cool. So it has like kind of a, uh, that local feel, even though that the wine itself, the juice is made in Central Valley, Chile. Um, I, mean, I believe it's called Car Carico Valley. Um, uh, and yeah, I mean, it's it's absolutely delicious. I'm going to start pouring some right now a little bit. Definitely. Yeah, now, I'll, really I'll speak a little bit also about the Pinot Noir grape, Austin, if you don't mind. So oh, the fun fact about the Pinot Noir grape uh, is that one, like we've mentioned the past couple of weeks, we've had Pinot Noirs on here that have yeah. all been super fantastic. But this is one of, the oldest grapes in the world, but it's also one of the hardest to grow. So the skin on these grapes are very, very thin. That It's become known as the heartbreaker to most winemakers around the world throughout the years. Um, but this wine especially is a really great example of a Pinot Noir that while still affordable to you in store, it's 100% Pinot Noir and it's absolutely delicious. A lot of your wines that you're going to find with Pinot Noir are very expensive um, and they'll 
once you get to this uh, high quality of a wine. Well, I mean, I, I would like to kind of in, iterate on what with the, the grapes itself, how it's like so hard to grow is just because like you said, yeah. they're so thin. You have certain weathers that it's almost like you need the happy medium weather for the grape mm -hmm. to uh, grow to like the perfect way to make a Pinot Noir. Because if you have too hot, the skin will, well, the grape itself will kind of raisin up and just dry too much. And that's where you get more like the sugars and that's not what, you know, Pinot Noir is really know, known for. But if you don't have enough, if it's too, if it's too dry itself, like I said, yeah, it, it dries up and stuff. But if it doesn't get enough water and all that kind of stuff, it's, I mean, it gets ruined. It's, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, your grapes are not going to be happy. They'll also get a lot of um, <laughs> disease. They'll die. We don't disease. want grapes to do that. Um, but the Pinot Noir especially is very susceptible to those. And the last thing the winemakers want to do is use an extraordinary amount of pesticides to try to save their grapes when, in fact, it's going to be a lost cause anyway, which is... Mm -hmm. Another reason why they're usually quite expensive. Now, in-store average price for the line in Dove Pinot Noir is only $11.99 around Maryland or D.C. It's one of my favorite brands to sell. I love every varietal of the line in Dove because they're super well balanced. A lot of them have won even the silver awards at the World Wine Challenges. Uh, this one won the silver award at the World Wine Challenge in 2019, the line in Dove Pinot Noir. If you have it with you this evening, once you taste it, you'll see why. Um, Austin, obviously you have it along with me, so we'll take a, a glance at it here. So it's got a really light ruby color, so it's not as dark looking. It doesn't have that very mm -hmm. red brick layered rim as the Signorio that we just tasted did. Um, but it, to your nose, it brings a lot of fruity and very spicy aromas as well. You'll notice a little bit of spice. Oh yeah, and some raspberries, some maybe light cherries. Oh. Yep. Perfect for your Thanksgiving dinner, literally. You're having some like uh, cranberry yeah. sauces that pairs so well with that. Yep. And I mentioned this is a really well balanced wine. So, for those of you that love to pair food with your wines, also mentioned pairing it with your Thanksgiving dinner. This could pair with a wide assortment of things because it is well balanced. It's not too acidic, it's not too tannic. So, it's just kind of right there in the middle. You can drink it all by itself similar to all the wines we actually tried this evening, but you can also pair it with your Thanksgiving meals. With the holidays coming up as well, it is important to note once again, all of these wines are vegan, they're kosher for Passover, and they're gluten-free. Yep. I love drinking them. I'm not vegan. Uh, I uh, don't, I'm not gluten intolerant, but I absolutely love the Line and Dove brand. It's super fantastic. I know that a lot of restaurants recently have picked up the Line and Dove. So if you're out and about as well, you'll notice that they're selling the Line and Dove by the glass. So go and support those places. If you haven't already done so, like Line and Dove on Facebook at Line and Dove Wines, as well as their Instagram, because they post really great stuff all week long, super fun events. They coordinate with Tag Magazine, a magazine based out of Washington DC as well. Um, so they're very community driven and well, I mean, the wine is delicious, Austin. So what else can I say? I, mean, I can't complain about it. It's, it's done well for me. You know, I mean, it's, it's very easy drinking. It's like <laughs> uh, I've been telling everyone, instead of just buying one bottle, you got to buy more than one. You got to share them, you know? Exactly. And I know a lot of stores recently have been doing, um, two bottle discounts, et cetera. So if yeah. your local stores around you don't yet carry the Line and Dove products, let them know to contact Line and Dove or DMV Distributing and we'll go ahead and help them out. I mean, Gina, yeah. So delicate, so affordable and easy drinking. Would you say this could pair with a steak and seafood? You know, I it's not necessarily a very full bodied red, Gina. So I don't think that I would put it up against a very heavy steak. You could. Um, I would probably go more towards a darker grape for that, um, like a Cabernet I mean, Sauvignon. We are, I mean, I hate to say it, we are going through this more quarantine, so people may be ordering more pizza and stuff. Yes. Perfect for pizza. Absolutely. Exactly. And your, and your seafood as well, Gina. Um, even salmon. I've paired it with salmon before. It was absolutely delicious. Um, Monica said they had it for Thanksgiving last year, and it paired well with the turkey and cranberry. Definitely cranberry sauce would pair so well with this wine, especially because it does have a lot of those raspberry and cherry flavors to it, but it has a little bit of that spiciness to just kind of add something as well to your food. Some pepperiness, 
some, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a little bit of like that white pepper that I absolutely love on the ends of red wine. Which not a lot of people have actually, to be honest, the white pepper. No, I, I love it. Now, if you guys have any questions, comments, let us know. Oh, hi, Susan, first time watcher. Oh, we love Kasha. Hope to have her back on soon. We drank a lot of ports last weekend. I'm sure Jess in the background here is thankful that we don't have any port this evening. Her pours did her in last weekend. That wasn't me. <laughs> but the ports were fantastic. If you guys are looking for ports, we can't uh, highly, more highly re recommend any ports other than the Pocus ports. Um, so great. We have a Ruby, the White, the Tawny, and we have a 10, 20, and 30 years well on shelves around Maryland and D.C. Well, if you haven't tried them, you got to try some. It's you absolutely have to. Yes. Now, if you're loving this Pinot Noir, I highly recommend trying the Pocus Ruby. It's quite similar, except this has almost half the alcohol content to it. Um, and that's just a, a, quite a bit sweeter. Yeah. So only just drink a little glass of that and a lot of this. <laughs> There's something good to bring to, uh, you know, the family gatherings. I mean, Hopefully, hopefully, you know, social distancing and all that, but like family gatherings, you know, it's perfect to sip on. Maybe like as an aperitif or as a dessert. Always, always. Now, guys, we're going to be giving away a line and face mask before we go this evening. We want to thank everyone for joining us. If you have any more questions, let us know. Um, we're going to pick at random. So uh, Jess in the background here is putting your names in our a random selector for those of you that have asked oh, questions, uh, left comments for us. We always appreciate your support here. Now, remember, like us on Facebook at DMV Dist, our Instagram as well. We do these every Friday at 7 p.m. Next week, we have four amazing wines from a New York winery, uh, Cuca Lake. Their uh, winery owner, as well as the winemaker, is going to be joining our owner, Alan Emery. So that's going to be a super fun show to watch. Really great, fantastic wines. Oh, look at the lineup there. So they've got the Cabernet Franc, the semi-dry Riesling, super great. The Vignet, gently dry. What does gently dry mean? You'll find out next week. And the Gewürztraminer Sunrise Hill. So they're located in the uh, Finger Lakes of New York. Really great winery. Mel Goldman and Ben Sherman from their winery is going to be joining us next week. There's where you can find all of those wines. Some of the stores only have three. You'll see there at the bottom. But if you have any questions, just let us know. And we'll definitely help you guys out with locating the wines. And if your favorite store that's right down the street from you doesn't carry it, just ask them to bring it in the store for you. That helps us and it helps you. Show it's them and the video. you get delicious wines. Yeah, show them a video too. They may want yeah. to get you know, I mean, it's... Doesn't hurt. Oh, I, can't, I can't wait to watch the video from next week. I'm super excited. I wish I could be here. Um, oh, here we go. All right. Maureen Lynn, thank you so much for joining us this evening. You won the Line and Dove face mask. So please uh, send us in our message, our messenger on Facebook, your email and mailing address so that we can get that sent to you. And cheers. I love our Line and Dove face mask. So I'm sure that you'll enjoy it. All right. So thanks so much for joining us, everyone. Maureen, enjoy your face mask when you get it. We want to say a good night to all of you. Drink up this weekend. Party safely with your family at home. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>